The Newburg Museum Speaking Series is proud to present Jim Hevron with the second installment in our series on Abraham Lincoln and his upbringing in southwest Indiana. A close look at Lincoln's father. Jim has been researching and studying the Lincoln family for 20 some years. And so we have a lot of knowledge here in the room that he's, as he begins to talk about Thomas Lincoln, and I'll have other announcements um, when this is over. Glad to see the audience here, a bunch of smiley faces. Hope you learn something from this presentation. Now, a couple of, of warnings. This presentation is on Thomas Lincoln only. Abraham will be referenced some, but this is on Thomas Lincoln. And I'm not knowledgeable enough to talk about Kentucky nor Illinois, but there are others here in the audience who can do that when we get down to question and answers at the end. With that, we'll start with this first slide. And I grabbed this picture. This is, picture was done by the Lincoln Boyhood National Memorial. They pass them out up there. But there is a question, a big question, on whether this is a picture of Lincoln or somebody else. Uh, and that's among the, a number of historians. I'm going to make these comments since I did not go to the trouble of getting permission to use, like there's some Google Earth stuff in here and such as that, permission to use that in a presentation, I'm going to say the pictures, no pictures may be taken from this presentation and reproduced. Now if there's something that somebody wants off of this, if I own the picture or have control of it, yes, I will let you have it. My goal is to get this information out. Since there's no pictures and this is not a normal PowerPoint presentation, I'm going to read, but you're going to have the same thing on the screen that I'm reading. If you have questions about them, I really don't want to stop now, but if there's something you don't understand or if I'm speaking too fast, let me know, please. Negative and positive commentary on Thomas Lincoln during his Indiana years, 1816 to 1830. Through the years, many historians have described Thomas Lincoln as worthless, shiftless, lazy, uneducated, unambitious, incompetent, as a carpenter and harsh with his son. In my opinion, this is not a fair assessment of Thomas Lincoln. And I will argue throughout this presentation that Thomas was intelligent, hardworking, and played an important role in shaping Abraham Lincoln, the 16th president. Why did Thomas Lincoln move from Kentucky to Indiana? Thomas was, well, was doing well with farming in Kentucky and woodworking skills, was married to Han Nancy and had two children, Sarah and Abraham, but Kentucky's deed system works to get worked against Thomas, and he lost each farm he had purchased or leased. Slavery was controversial, and he and Nancy believed slavery was wrong. When he heard about the land in the new territory, it was surveyed by the government and can be purchased from the government with a good government deed. That enticed him. Indiana was also, according to the Northwest Ordinance, a slave-free state. So that enticed him even more. Abraham Lincoln, in his June 1860 autobiography written in third person for John Scripps, gives the reason why Thomas decided to move to Indiana, arriving about the time Indiana became a state on December 11, 1816. Now this is from Lincoln's autobiography, so this is Lincoln speaking. At this time, his father resided in, on Knob Creek, on the road from Bardstown, Kentucky, to Nashville, Tennessee, at a point three or three and a half miles south or southwest of Atherton's Ferry on the Rolling Fork. From this place he removed to what is now Spencer County, Indiana in the autumn of 1816. Abraham then being in his eighth year. Let me explain that. That's always the way Abraham said. In other words, once he passed seven or whatever age it was, he was using, I'm in my eighth year. This removal was partly on account of slavery, slavery, but chiefly on account of difficulty in line, land titles. In the late fall of 1816, Thomas decided to make a new life in Indiana. Thomas built and loaded a flatboat with household furniture, his tools, a supply of nails, whiskey, and other effects. He floated down the rolling fork, but the boat capsized and he lost their three-corner cabinet some tools, a supply of nails, and other items. He managed to retrieve some of the items and continued on the Beach Fork and then into the Great Ohio. 
We make a comment there also. There are some who don't believe he came by flatboat. But there's too many things you look at that nobody could make up the trip he made and where he landed without knowing what they were talking about. It wasn't going to be something he just made up. He made his way downstream and landed on the Indiana side of the Ohio River at Posey's Landing. Thomas stored his belongings in flatboat with Thomas with Francis Posey and went on by foot and found a location in what is now Spencer County, Indiana. He marked the property by piling brush at corners and erected a half-face camp. He then proceeded to walk back to Kentucky to ready the family for the trip to Indiana. Now again, a comment on that statement right there. Most of the authors, I don't think, think about the amount of time it would have taken to walk the 17 mile inland. How did he find that strip of land that he wanted? He had a road that went to Santa Claus and then into Lincoln, Lincoln City, but how did he find the four corners of that land? In December 1816, the Thomas Lincoln family loaded their remaining belongings and came by horseback. Some historians say the Lincolns came to Indiana using two horses, and some say three horses, carrying their bedding, their cooking utensils, utensils, food needed for the journey, and for a time after arriving. Nancy and Sarah rode one horse and Abe the other, walking for the rest of the way. Thomas walked the entire distance. After crossing the Ohio River to the Indiana side, it is said Thomas borrowed or rented a wagon from Francis Posey to move the belongings he had brought earlier by flatboat the property he had selected to the property he had selected. At the time Thomas made his, his land claim, property was in Perry County as Spencer County was not formed until 1818, being cut out of Perry and Warwick County. The trip was 17 miles. The first 13 miles was by way of the Troy Vincennes Road, which was an early military road, to present-day Santa Claus. And the last four miles was over a narrow trail that was a mail route. They had, they had to widen parts of this trail to get the wagon through to reach their new claim in what is today uh, Lincoln City, Indiana. This is the Troy Vincennes Road. Then here's where the old mail route was at trail and that's where they had to widen to get to their, to their site. This map was prepared by Edwin Barris, National Park Service historian, showing where Lincoln crossed Ohio by ferry and on to the land claim. The Lincoln family finally arrived in Indiana at the site that Thomas had selected and erected the half-face camp at about the time Indiana became a state, which was December 11, 1816. How long did the Lincoln family live in the half-face camp? Abraham, Abraham tells us in his autobiography dated June 1860 to John Scripps. This is Abraham again. At this place, Abraham took an early start as a hunter, which was never much improved afterward. A few days before the completion of his eighth year, in the absence of his father, a flock of turkeys approached the new log cabin, and Abraham, with rifle gun standing inside, shot through a crack and killed one of them. This would have been before Abraham's birthday on February 12, 1817. If they arrived around December 11, 1816, this tells us that they lived in the half-face camp less than 60 days before moving into a round log cabin which had spaces between the logs until the walls could be chinked. Understand what I'm talking about there? That first cabin was built out of just trees that were cut, were clean, were not, were not uh, hewn, so these logs were going to have uneven places in them, so there were, that's why the big cracks were there. And that's what they filled up to close them. Most historians and authors say they were in the half-face camp anywhere from six months to two years. And the two years shows up quite a bit. I would go with Abraham Lincoln's time frame that's in his own words. Claim one, Thomas was lazy. Brian Dirk, professor of history at Anderson University in Indiana, wrote in his 2017 book titled Lincoln in Indiana. One person who knew him has sneered that Thomas was nothing more than an excellent species of poor white trash, was as lazy as loafing, as shiftless as could be, and as poor as poverty. This is in 2017. In late 1816, early 1817, Thomas started clearing land for a pasture for field corn, which they also made cornmeal out of, wheat for flour, and a vegetable garden. 
They also relied heavily on wild animals, natural fruits, and berries for food. Thomas would start clearing and cutting logs for a new cabin, also gathering various types of wood for furniture. He would need cherry, walnut, and poplar to cure for this. Considering the age of his children, Thomas was doing most of this work alone. Thomas selected land in the southwest quarter of Section 32, even though it was very poor, poor farm ground. One possible reason may have been that in in the December 1805 survey, it states that the timber on this mile was chiefly destroyed by fire, and land is very thick with brush. This made the area more attractive as it would have been easier to clear as most of the large trees and stump were dead, and they could burn the brush to clear it. Now, I didn't put it in here, but let me go one step farther. If you look at the surveyor's report real close, the largest timber on the property at that time they listed was six inches in diameter. So that's how, how the, the fire had been even before the 180, 1805 survey by a bunch of years. And if anybody has ever tried to clear trees and stumps out, you know what kind of job that would be. In the fall of 1817, Nancy's relatives, Thomas and Betsy Sparrow and their nephew Dennis Hanks came to live with the Lincolns and lived in the half-face camp. So now the Lincolns are providing for seven people. Thomas would need to continue more acreage each year to increase his tillable acreage. He also acquired a couple of cows and some chickens, but the pigs were wild in the area. He also needed to build a barn, a corn crib, and a chicken pen to protect the animals from predators, a smokehouse to cure their meat for the winter, and a cellar or mound to bury potatoes and turnips. The fruit and vegetables would have been dried and stored dry. Also would build a carpenter shop to do his woodworking and protect his tools. They would have to save their seed and keep for the next year's planting. This demonstrates that Thomas was not a lazy man. He was determined to own land, clear, free and clear, free, clear and free, and make a new home and provide for his family. This is a copy of the receipt Thomas received when he made the trip to Vincennes Land Office on October 12, 1817 to file his claim for the southwest quarter of Section 32, Township 4 South, Range 5 West, containing 160 acres at $2 per acre. Notice Lincoln is spelled Lincoln. Okay? The receipt is for a total of $80, which was one quarter of the amount on purchase. In 1818, Thomas built a new hewn log cabin that was called the Grand Oak Cabin that the Lincolns lived in until they left to go to Illinois. Thomas built a three-corner cabinet he had promised Nancy since he had lost theirs when the flatboat offended and the cabinet fell in the river. This would have been the first cabinet built in Indiana, cabinet for Nancy. Sadness came to the Lincoln family in the fall of 1818 when Nancy died from the milk sickness. The disease also took the lives of Thomas and Nancy Sparrow and a neighbor, Nancy Bruner. Thomas is thought to have made the coffins for each and Abraham whittled the, peg, the pegs for at least his mother's. John Carter, a neighbor to the south, furnished a plot of land on a nearby hill for a cemetery. So now Thomas was left alone to raise Sarah, Abraham, and Dennis. About a year after about a year, Thomas returned to Elizabethtown, Kentucky and asked Sally Bush Johnston, who was an old friend and now a widow, to marry him. She agreed and they had turned to in, returned to Indiana with her belongings and her three children. So now it's a family of eight to provide for. And below is the mark, this is the marker of Nancy Hanks Lincoln, which is located in the cemetery at Lincoln uh, Boyhood National Memorial. Claim number two, Thomas was incompetent. Brian Professor, Professor Brian Dirk again wrote in his book, Lincoln in Indiana. Thomas's skill level may have been partly to blame, as it seems to have been, as he seems to have been only somewhat competent. I'm going to try to disprove these as we go on. The next slide is, this is a report done by Bill Bartell. And this is what Bill did at the National Park Service for many years, was did different reports. But anyway, this was done in July 1989, and it was part of Research Project 39 and quarter, and 40. 
and I think if I'm correct, Bill, the two projects were Spencer County and Posey County, correct? Combined into that? I don't remember, but the, throughout the year, the Park Service people would write out questions that came up, and then when I would come in, so the, there was a question number 39 and question 40. So okay. I don't remember specifically what they were. Okay. So this is going to get kind of complicated, so slow me down and ask questions if you need to. This land was first offered by the government under the Land Act of 1800. This is Northwest Territory, and cost would be $2 per acre. Well, I pause right there and I think, who in the whatever, going back to 1800, could afford to pay $1,200 for a piece of land? That's about like our Congress is today. 1804, the act was amended to reduce the minimum amount to 160 acres. So now you were going to pay a total of $320. After the financial panic of 1819, the government decided the problem could no longer be ignored. It was obvious from the beginning that many debtors were not going to be able to meet their obligation. This land was all financed by the government. On April 24th, 1820, Congress passed an act which mandated a sweeping change in the method of government land sales. After July 1, 1820, tracts of land as small as 80 acres could be purchased for the minimum price of $1.25 per acre, payable in cash only. This act, however, did nothing for people like Thomas Lincoln who had not made any additional payments on the land since he had made the payment in 1817. Congress responded with a relief act to solve the problem for which they must take partial responsibility. This act was dated March 2nd, 1821. In this act, Section 3, debtors were divided into three classes, determined, what per, but determined by what percentage of the debt remain. Thomas qualified for the first class as he had only paid one quarter of the debt and would have eight additional payments to repay the debt. To be eligible to benefit from the Relief Act, the debtor had to file his written consent to the act before September 30, 1821. Thomas Lincoln made trip to Vincennes on September 12, 1821 to take advantage of the law. Out on the real frontier, how did Thomas find out about this stuff? How was Thomas smart enough to know what to do? I mean, it didn't talk anything with anybody about attorney or any help. Thomas, I, I'm assuming, did all this on his own. So is that somebody that is what they have been claiming he is? On April 30, 1827, Thomas Lincoln made at least a two-day trip to Vincennes to conduct his most complicated transaction. He relinquished the east 80 acres of his original claim in Section 32, Township 4 South, Range 5 West, of his Spencer County land he had claimed on October 13, 1817. He was given credit in the amount of $160 for this action. So he gave up half of the 160 acres he had, pu he had purchased, turned it back into the government, and got the full credit back for that property and applied to the loan. <clears throat> Thomas also relinquished 80 acres of land that he had somehow acquired in Posey County, Indiana, for which he was credited $80 for this parcel, which paid his debt in full. This land was located in Section 3, Township 4, South, Range 5 West, being the northwest of the northwest quarter of this section. Therefore, on June 6, 1827, a patent was issued by President John Quincy Adams for the 80 acres. Thomas is now debt-free. Thomas took advantage of these laws, thus showing that he was, a competent, was competent in handling complex business affairs. This map shows the location of the parcel of land that we don't, and I know Bill researched this a bunch, I tried to research it a bunch and could not get an idea of how Thomas really acquired this land, how he got it. But anyway, if you look, here is Wadesville, Indiana, so it's due north of Wadesville. I'm Blair. Blairsville, I'm sorry. Here's Wadesville, it is northeast of Wadesville, so that's where it was in the eastern part of Posey County. Okay, a lot of authors said that, and Dennis Hanks said, Thomas never received a patent deed. Well, here's the patent deed that, that Thomas re was issued June 15, 1827 by John Quincy Adam, issued to Thomas Lincoln, alias Leacorn. 
So we know he got a title for his land. He got a government title. This picture shows the boundaries of Lincoln's original 160-acre claim. Somehow Thomas determined that a spring was located about 50 feet over on the David Casebeer claim to the, east, to the west of him. Sometime between May 4th, 1817 and April 14th, 1820, Thomas Lincoln purchased 20 acres from David Casebeer along the east section line of the southeast quarter of section 31. This strip was 260 feet long by 330 feet wide, containing 20 acres. This would have been an illegal transaction, as Casebeer never owned this property. But the transaction was honored by the eventual owner, James Gentry. This Thomas made a smart business move in ensuring the spring was on his land, guaranteeing him a source of water. One thing of interest has always been to me and the people of Lincoln City and Heritage Hills High School especially had no idea the east line of Thomas's original claim goes through the middle of the Heritage Hills football field, the jungles they call it. Yeah, here's the spring. And look at the word that we're, and I, you know, these are very hard to place, but I'm going to say the spring was less, is less than 50 feet off of Thomas's line. Now, after all these years and he's there, how does he sight through enough to know that that spring is not on his land? Claim three, Thomas treated Abraham poorly. In 2008, Michael Burlingame, current president of the Illinois Abraham Lincoln Association, wrote the following in his book, Boyhood and Adolescence in Indiana, 1816-1830. In chapter two, he titled the chapter, I Used to Be a Slave. Feeling the drudgery and what he called parental tyranny, Lincoln strove to distance himself from the world of his father, who embodied the indolence and backwardsness that his son disliked. Chapter two ends with the following sentence. This is the end of the end of the of the book of, of, of the chapter two. As he, Abraham, stepped from the Macon County cabin, he said, Free at last, free at last. Okay. Thomas Lincoln's view on education. The first school the Lincoln children attended was the Andrew Crawford School in the winter of 1819-1820, and it was a subscription school, as the parents had to pay their ch for their children to attend. This teacher, Crawford, stressed adequate reading, writing, and ciphering. The cost was $1.50 to $2 per child. So here Thomas is sending five kids to school, paying for them to go. Was this somebody who didn't think much about education, or? Treating it, treating poorly. So Thomas and Sally were paying for five children. The next school they ate was the Azel Dorsey School, which had a strong emphasis on English. There was a third school taught by James Swaney and was th located about 4.5 miles southwest of the Lincoln Farm. There may have been a few other schools, but these were the only three Lincoln mentioned in his autobiography. We thank the last school the Swaney School, Dorsey School, I'm sorry, was only attended by Abraham. Thomas was proud of Abraham's intelligent and intelligence and learning and did what he could to keep Abraham and his other children in school. Yes, he may have taken them from school when work was needed to be done. This was common practice for all pioneers. Sally said later in her later years that as a usual thing, Mr. Lincoln never made Abe quit reading to do anything if he could avoid it. He would do it himself first. Abraham also told an associate, my father had suffered greatly for the want of an education, and he was determined that I should be well educated. He was especially interested in me learning math, but their ideas of being well educated were different. Thomas's relationship with Abraham. Thomas taught Abraham how to build furniture and do carpentry work. Abraham's work does not show the skill or care evident in Thomas's pieces. Abraham wanted to become something more than a farmer tradesman like his father, who enjoyed and was content with pioneer life. Some say that Thomas was closer with his stepson, John D. Johnston. John D. and Thomas thought more alike than Abraham and Thomas. 
John hunted and worked on the farm with Thomas, whereas Abraham did not hunt and preferred books and learning over manual labor. Abraham once said, My father taught me to work, but he did not teach me to like it. Was Thomas abusive to Abraham? Thomas did discipline Abraham, but he and Sally disciplined all their children as parents should. Dennis Hanks tells of one time that Thomas knocked Abraham off a fence when he was questioning passing strangers. And these strangers would have been passing on the New Harmony Cordon Road, which is the main east-west road going, going, across, going across the bottom, of right at their, their south uh, property edge. Uh, what Thomas did not like was when Abraham was forward with strangers, this was considered to be impolite. Dennis also said, as a rule, Thomas took Abraham to the side and disciplined him, him in private. Now, I threw this in. This is not really about their time. Later in life, Abraham and Mary also disciplined their children. But after the death of their son, Eddie, they became less lax on this issue. Much more lax, okay. An especially outlandish claim on this topic comes once again from Brian, Brian Dirk in his book, Lincoln in Indiana. Worst of all, when Abraham did manage to earn a bit of money by doing odd jobs in the area, Thomas demanded his wages, son's wages, every cent. Around 1825, when Abraham was 16, trade was picking up and Thomas was able to trade furniture, cabinets, barrels, and farm surplus. He was able to hire Abraham out for wages as well as barter for goods. The custom and the law of the time was for that any money earned by children became the property of their father. It was customary for the fathers to return a portion of the money for their own use. Thomas followed the custom and allowed Abraham to keep some of his earnings, which he used for buying fabric for a new shirt and toward the purchase of a books. Abraham was not a slave to Thomas, but aided the family as many children did then and still do today. The Lincolns moved to Illinois in 1830. Why would the Lincolns decide to move to Illinois when Thomas was content with his life and, what, and was in the process of building a new cabin? It was not because Thomas was shiftless, as many claim, and wanted to go. It was because Sally wanted to go. She did not want to be separated from her children and grandchildren. Dennis Hanks, who was married to Sally's daughter Elizabeth, had been corresponding with his half-brother John Hanks, who had moved to Illinois about 1825. Dennis decided to make the move to Illinois and persuaded the extended family to move as well, as the land was good and the soil was rich. The journey to Illinois. Thomas began to sell his assets that he had accumulated in 14 years. He owned 100 acres of 40 acres under cultivation. Imagine. 14 years and you hand clear 40 acres. I mean, I can't imagine. He had a workshop, a smokehouse, and other buildings. He sold 80 acres to Charles Grigsby, the 80 acres to sold Charles Grigsby, and traded the 20 acres that he had got from, from Casabir to John Romine for a horse. He had livestock consisting of goats, lambs, chickens, cows, and hogs. He sold to David Turnham four to 500 bushels of corn. I know the, I, I will agree that that was very poor land, but he had to be doing pretty good to accumulate that much corn. And he threw in a hundred hogs. After settling up all affairs, he had nearly 500 cash in cash and whatever money he had at the time to begin a new life in Illinois. Part of this cash was, was from uh, his, his wife, Sally. They owned a piece of property in Kentucky which they went back and sold, and they paid $25 for it, and she got $250 for it. So that's what, what made up that $500. To briefly reflect on claim one, these deals could not have been so successfully achieved by a shiftless, worthless man. On March 1, 1830, 52-year-old Thomas and 41-year-old Sally and their th three families left Indiana for a new home in Illinois. Let me back up here a second and make another comment. Back, you know, today the market for the homes are, they're going to sell. You know, it's just going to be a negotiating of price. Back then, you're basically going to have to give it away or take a cut in what you're doing. So when Grigsby bought this, he bought it for less money than Thomas paid for it, plus he got all the buildings. 
So it was a bargain for him, but Thomas was smart enough to realize that he had to move it. On March 1st, 1830, 50-year-old Thomas and 41-year-old Sally and their three families left Indiana for a new home in Illinois. What did 21-year-old Abraham do? Abraham was 21 and could have legally chosen his own course in life. He chose to travel with the family and relocate. He also spent 30-some dollars of his own money at the local store to purchase notions, such as buttons, needles, threads, pins, knives, forks, spoons, and other domestic items. He peddled these goods along the way to Illinois and doubled his money. This money shows that Thomas had allowed Abraham to keep some of his earn some of the money he had earned. Okay, Abraham stayed with the family for over a year in Macon County before he moved on to begin a new life of his own in New Salem, Illinois. Abe made sure that they had a cabin, made sure they had fenced some of the land for the cattle and so forth to roam. Rome, and I'm sure helped get the grass cut down and get uh, ground made to raise crops or especially a garden. It was fortunate for the family that Abe did stay with them because the winter of 1830-1831 in Illinois was one of extreme weather. It, it was known as the winter of the deep snow. Snow began falling in November and continued off and on until late January. They received two to three feet of snow that drifted to depths of six feet, and freezing rain put a layer of ice on top. It was a very difficult time. Food and fuel supplies ran low, and livestock, livestock suffered and perished as well. Thomas and Sally probably would not have survived if Abe had not stayed with them. After moving to New Salem, Abraham kept in close contact with the family. He knew what they were doing and how they were doing, and had an open hand to help Thomas and Sally throughout the difficulties of their Illinois years. Furthermore, Thomas Lincoln was a man of high morals who was highly regarded in the Little Pigeon Creek community. This is evident in the instrumental role Thomas played as an active member of the Little Pigeon Creek Baptist Church. Thomas and Nancy, then Thomas and Sally, were associated with the Baptist religion. They believed and followed a very strict standard of morality and behavior. Daily Bible reading was important, and they believed and taught opposition to slavery to their children, and these lessons stayed with Abraham his entire life. A church was organized on June 8, 1816. It was constituted as a regular Baptist church. The church met in members' homes for the first six years. Land for a new church was donated by Noah Garden, and after much discussion to details, Thomas was chosen to oversee the planning and the construction, and he applied his woodworking skills. He also built the pulpit and window casings. The first service in the new meeting house was April 13, 1822. The church acted as sort of a court-type system as members could bring charges against other members, such as a husband drinking too much, or if there was a squabble between neighbors, or if the man of the family does not attend church and more. Thomas often served as moderator on these disputes. I gotta add one thing here. When the Lincolns were ready to leave the Illinois, you go to the church and you get a letter that you're in good standing with the church, and you take that to where you're going to rejoin a, a, a Baptist church. Well, Nancy Grigsby disagreed and the letter was recalled. Well, this dates back to probably some other things besides just her disagreeing with that at this point in time. Anyway, uh, they resolved the dispute and they got their letter back to leave. So then immediately following that, a lady files charges against Nancy Grigby, Nan uh, Elizabeth Richardson. Charges be brought against her for mistreating her and saying bad things about her. So guess who the moderator was of that five panel so-called jury or Thomas Lincoln. So in a three to two vote, they declared that they dismissed the case. So I don't know whether that was a... <laughs> Thomas served on different committees and his integrity and moral behavior were highly respected. This is a picture of the Pigeon, Little Pigeon Creek Baptist Church. The first church just had one chimney, so this picture, this is the original church, 
with the second chimney added. This would be after September 1828. The congregation had, had voted to upgrade the church, and this is one of the upgrades. This is the marker of Sarah Lincoln Grigsby. This is also the grave of Thomas and Nancy Hanks Lincoln's daughter Sarah, who died in childbirth on January 20, 1828. Her baby is buried with her. A cemetery was laid out in 1825 next to Little Pigeon Creek Baptist Church. In June 1816, this marker was replaced by the state of Indiana to honor Sarah. In conclusion, Abraham learned much from Thomas and kept many of these lessons throughout his life. Both were known for their honesty and integrity and for doing the right thing. They were hospitable, welcoming, caring, and both were great storytellers. Yes, they had differences that pushed them apart, but they were always connected. Thomas was not a worthless, lazy piece of white trash, but neither was he the lifelong success of whom Abraham Lincoln was proud. Father and son were different and went different paths. The following quote from Lewis Warren's book, Lincoln's Youth, Indiana Years, perfectly summarizes the true nature of Thomas Lincoln with Abraham. This is from Lewis Warren, revealed a man more nearly typical of his time a man who owned horses and livestock, paid his share of taxes, assembled cash and credit to acquire farmland, served the country when necessary, and maintained his standing in the local Baptist church. Based upon records rather than recollections, a portrait of Thomas as, st as a sturdy pillow of the frontier community rather than shiftless drifter provides more solid ground for interpretation. Yet neither portrait alone will eliminate the tangled relationship of father and son. The importance of Thomas Lincoln lies in who he was, more of who of what he was than in what his son thought about him. Claim four, Thomas was a poor carpenter. Professor Brian Dirk again wrote in his book, Lincoln in Indiana. Several exact pieces of furniture attributed to him show quality craftsmanship, but one friend called him a tolerable country house carpenter and another referred to him less charitably as a kind of rough carpenter. While living in Kentucky, Thomas had actually been sued by a customer for shoddy workmanship. Thomas was more than a farmer. <clears throat> Thomas had established himself in the area as a cooper, a carpenter, and a cabinet maker. He made barrels for the neighbors who had distilleries. He helped to build cabins and finish the interiors. He made different types of furniture. He built three corner cabinets for many families, and we will see some of these later. After viewing these impressive pieces, I'm sure you'll agree with me that workmanship was not shoddy. Steve Hoff is noted authority on Thomas Lincoln furniture. Thomas Lincoln was a creative, hardworking, honest, industrious, master craftsman and prominent Spencer County citizen. To believe or say otherwise would be a myth. Now I would like to show you some examples of Thomas Lincoln's craftsmanship. You will see the impressive three-corner cabinets with contrasting woods and beautiful inlays that Thomas produced while living in Indiana. These cabinets show how smart Thomas was with math and measuring to get the design perfect for each cabinet. They have survived for over 200 years. Also, he would make furniture based on the price people would be willing to pay. Would like to note also that Thomas was blind in one eye it did some of the later work by feel. This disability will show in later cabinets. Okay, I'm doing something I said I wouldn't do. I'm going to start with the Kentucky cabinet that the Lincolns used in Kentucky that fell in the river and it busted apart. So later it was, it was, was recovered and restored by John Colley, was purchased by R. Gerald McMurtry in 1938 in exchange for a new sh uh, cabinet that was in a hardware store that he paid $17.50 for. Location at Abraham Lincoln, located at Lincoln Library and Museum, Lincoln Memorial University, Harrogate, Tennessee. Do not know whether Lincoln University owns it or whether McMurtry Sun still has it on display there. Another interesting thing on this library, this library at Harrogate, Tennessee was funded by Carlin, uh, Colonel Harlan Sanders. Okay. This is the first cabinet built in Indiana. This is the Lincoln family cabinet used in Indiana, built in 1818. 
first cabinet built in Indiana, made of cherry and poplar, wood whipsawed by hand, built using wooden pegs, no nails. Ownership went from the Lincolns to the Gentry family, still owned by a Gentry descendant today. I want to introduce somebody that just came in. He had run into a conflict. Steve, where are you at, Hoff? I saw you come in. Why don't, why don't you come up front here a minute? <laughs> Look at this cabinet up the top. That's probably where some kind of a varmint, a mouse, a, a whatever trying to get in. On the left side is where the, there was a skillet burn into the, into the cabinet. The bottom doors are missing. They were originally on it. Can you all see the marks in the, in the lumber here? That's the whipsaw marks. They had to saw all that wood by hand because there was no pired mills in the area at that time. Here's what a whip saw would have looked like. This is one that was on, put on display at Dale, Indiana by Ori Brown, Ori Brown. A pit was dug and one man was on top and a second in the pit. I don't know, under, I can't f fathom how they sold this wood straight enough to get the, tit, the wood they needed straight to build these cabinets. Lutz cabinet and the gentleman who owns this cabinet is present today also. Built circa 1820, cherry wood, light inlays, whip sawed, wooden pegs again. It's presently on loan and displayed at the Indiana State Museum. This is a picture taken at Indianapolis, Indiana when these two cabinets were side by side on display at the Indiana State Museum on June 29, 2013. Design on the Lutz cabinet, you can barely see it, but the inlay stops up here, the top inlay, the same with this one, but this one comes ahead down and this one does too, but this one has some inlay work at the very bottom. That is different between the two, and this one is a, a larger cabinet, but this one is also built more square to fit a true corner. This one here that was in, in the Lincoln cabin ended up being unsquare because the wall of the cabin was not square where it went or a corner. This is a Sally Bush Johnston Lincoln table, circa 1820. Small walnut table stand, lumber was whipsawed again, put together with wooden pegs. You can see some of the wooden pegs uh, used in cabin by Sally. Location at the Abraham Lincoln Birthplace National Park near Hodgenville, Kentucky. Okay, this is the David Turnham cabinet, circa 1822 made of walnut. The one that, that in Kentucky was made of cherry. That was the difference I didn't put on there, I'm sorry. Wood was cut by the, this is the first wood cut by pard saw. Cornice across the top is carved and inlaid with hole and tooth design and star and streamer down the sides. And it's, it's pretty hard to see there. You can see it on the other cabinet pretty, pretty good. Cabinet design the same as the Lincoln, Kentucky cabinet. Location is in the Evansville Arts History and Science Museum here in Evansville. Okay, this is a little bit out of the, out of the realm again. This is a five drawer, drawer chest made by Thomas Lincoln, crafted by Lincoln in Kentucky for his sister Mary Croom, circa 1815. So this craftsmanship was when he was still in, in Kentucky, located at Southern Illinois University, Carbondale, Illinois. This is similar to one that David Turnham had uh, Abraham or Thomas make for him for wedding furniture when he got married. So we do not have a picture of it. It is last location of Turnham Chest was in private hands in Indianapolis, Indiana. We have all tried our darndest to get to talk to the guy to see it and no luck. Dr. John Crook Cherry Desk and Bookcase, circa 1825. I'm gonna use the word purportedly because one of the Spencer County Historical Society members did a research and report on the first doctor in Spencer County and he came up with claims of about three or four different doctors being the first in Spencer County. So that's why I put purportedly there. Location is that's the, the most I know about it. Uh, Steve, it's made of cherry, correct? Okay. Location is Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum in Springfield, Illinois. Now all these locations I'm giving is the last location known. Nancy and Amos Richardson, circa 1826, no inlay. So this is going to be the first cabinet 
completely bare of any inlay. Locations, this is made out of walnut, correct, Steve? Yes, it is. Okay. Location, Indiana State Museum, Indianapolis, Indiana, which they bought and own. Aaron Grigsby Wetherill, wedding gift to Aaron and Sarah Lincoln Grigsby on August 2nd, 1826. No inlay again. Location, William L. Clements Library, University of Michigan. Reuben Grigsby, circa 1826, cherry, no inlay again. Now, there's a big question on, on this cabinet. Uh, the location, the last known location was uh, Knox College. Steve, am I correct in saying that this cabinet, the top of it and a lot of it was completely rebuilt? Uh, yes, it is. Actually, So anyway, I have a white, black and white picture of the original, which I don't know whether Steve acquired or we acquired, but down to the bottom it says Heverin Cabinet. Well, it was, it was not in, in the Heverin family. It wasn't, wasn't a Heverin Cabinet. Crawford Jennings Siderman, circa 1827, Walnut Three Corner Cabinet. No inlay again. This location is Henry Ford Museum, Dearborn, Michigan. Let me explain something about these pictures. It's kind of a, a thing between us in, that are doing research work that I don't want to ask anybody to share something with me. They've uncovered that, it's theirs, it's not mine. The stuff I have, I will share with anybody. But I could have got some different pictures, but I didn't go to the problem of asking somebody to borrow one for this presentation. So that's why I'm using some of these older pictures that aren't very good. This is the Crawford Meese Brown, circa 1828 walnut cupboard. This is the one, I'm gonna say this first, at the Lincoln Pioneer Village, Rockport, Indiana. This is one, by this time, Lincoln was probably really could not see. And you can see the inlay on the side of it, the top and so forth. So that's why uh, we're contributing part of it to uh, Abraham trying to do the inlay, which was not the, as good an inlay of what Thomas would have done. The other thing about this cabinet, I'll, I'll make one other comment. I don't know whether Steve will agree with me or not. It seems, Steve, that the, ter the cabinets that were put together by Peg are more, si more uh, sturdy and no movement in them compared to the ones where nails were used. This is a piece that was purportedly uh, built by Thomas Lincoln, supposedly built by, I'm sorry, Abraham Lincoln. I don't know what the correct title is, spice box or bookcase or for his school belongings. Uh, it's went through several owners. Uh, the ownership is kind of hard to follow coming down. Location, the Evansville Museum of Arts, History and Science. And they, they, the museum owns it. Well, it was donated to him. In low first, de first desk, circa, don't know. And I had, I had made, made a comment to Steve, I thought I had found when it, it had to be built after what point in time, but then what I found did not turn out to be true. Traded for a grist at Enlow Mill, ja Enlo Mill, Jasper, Indiana. Location gifted to Lincoln Boyhood National Memorial Lincoln City, Indiana, by the John First family in 2018. There is some doubt by more than one about whether this is legit that 
Lincoln built or not. This is a replica of the Lincoln Gentry cabinet that Steve graciously made for Barbara and I. He used the same tools and methods that Thomas used. It's cherry wood. It, it was not hand sawed. It, it, it didn't want to go through that. The lumber came from Utah, correct, Steve? Yes. The cherry? Owned by Barbara and myself. Okay, what I want to show here, look at the inlay on it where you can see it better. And this, 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 these are hard to photo for some reason. Here we'll give you an idea of some of the intricacy. Can you see real quick on this, on this inlay the compass marks where Thomas would have drawn all these circles and how he spaced them down through there and what they did? This particular cabinet has 30, at least 32 wooden pegs in it. You can see the, the wooden pegs there because th the original cabinet had no, no nails in it. Here's another look at that cabinet showing the inlay across the top. Now can you imagine, can you imagine being able to figure this out and every cabinet was separate. Look at the two that are identical, the Lutz cabinet and this cabinet, not, not, not identical, this is, a, is a, you know, the third one, but the, the first two are not the same size. So Thomas had to sit down and figure this. So I think some of the quotes that came up were, uh, Nathaniel Griggins was one of them, Thomas, all he did was set and piddle a lot. Well, can you imagine setting and drawing this on a piece of wood? And I'll tell you why you did that. If you messed up, guess what? You had to start over. Here's the bottom panels on it. You can see a little bit of different inlay down here. On a, you can get it up real close. You can see the, the compass marks again to where these were all made. Bottom doors with inlay and more wooden pegs across the bottom. Okay. Questions and answers. Now, while this is going on, Barbara's going to put some slides up. Yeah. Yes? On the Pioneer, like in Indiana, where would Thomas have gotten like the finish for the wooden cabinet? That's, those are all natural finish. Mm -hmm. Our cabinet is natural finish. There's been nothing put on it to color it. It has probably darkened at least three times of what it was when we first got it and will keep darkening. Yes, Josh? Do you think that picture of Thomas is in fact him and why or why not? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I have no opinion on that. Uh, I can't find anything that really verifies it for me, and I really can't find anything that unverifies it. There's except a link, there's a Lincoln Lore article written on it, and that's where the right. doubt comes in. Yes, sir, John. Why did I saw two or three of the cabinets are now in Michigan? Why in Michigan? I have no idea. <laughs> Anybody else have an idea why they went to Michigan? Well, the, they, they're the ones that bought them. Yeah. What did you say Henry Ford paid for that you mentioned that? Somebody? Well, there was was in, in a in a in a story there was was rumor that that cabinet in 18, 1928, Henry Ford paid twenty five thousand dollars for it. When did Thomas Lincoln die? Oh mercy, eighteen fifty one. Fifty one. I just wanted to throw this in. How many of you? Have, well, a lot of you are here from Spencer County. There's some that are not. How many realize this is what Lincoln City looked like with a, with a European hotel before Easter 1811? Here's another picture of Lincoln City with a train at the depot. This would have been prior because the, the European hotel sits right here. Look how they built boardwalks out to go across to the, to the train station. This is the lake at Lincoln City that was built by the railroad to furnish the water for, the, for all the railroad uses of steam engines. It was also a big lake used for much recreation by the local people. If you look in the picture, there sits the European Hotel. This is the original entrance to Lincoln State Park. This is not, this is a later picture as the shrub had all matured. I'm going to give this a circa 1815 picture. This entrance actually opened in 1908. Circa should be 1915. <laughs> so that's what the original entrance looked like. Had lions out at the front, had eagles on poles back here, had a flagpole in the center. It was quite an entrance. Well, when the state of Indiana took over the park later, 
and they moved everything to the south end where the memorial was built. Thank you all for such a good audience for being here. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, Jim. You're we quite really welcome. Appreciate it. Thank you, Barbara, for you know all that you both have done and coming here and sharing this with us. Thank you to each of you who have came to the Newburgh Museum. We will, um, if you would like to stick around, we'll remove the chairs as quickly as we can. If you've never been to the Newburgh Museum, please walk through this Newburgh Rocks exhibit. Um, we look forward to you seeing and come back at another time. Also like to announce that Newburgh Remembers is coming up at the end of September, beginning September the 19th with the ladies tea at Rolling Hills in the afternoon. And then we begin on uh, September the 24th with Sweet Frenzy at Rolling Hills. Continuing with Ray Molusky, who wrote Thunder from a Clear Sky about the raid on Newburgh. He will be here giving two tours and a book discussion on the 25th. And then our ending day is on the 26th and it will be uh, the laying of the wreath in remembrance of the raid, followed by Freetown Village, which is an African-American gospel storytelling group, and then the reading of the Gettysburg Address. So mm -hmm. we invite you, some of these are free activities, others you know, are paid activities, um, because it is a fundraiser for the museum. So we invite you all to participate. You can find us on our website at newburghmuseum.org, as well as we have a few brochures back there.